Let's all say amen, amen. this time. Amen. God is good. Amen. God is really good, isn't he? Amen. How sweet he is. <laughs> good morning, church. I want to begin this morning by simply saying that, you know, it's refreshing to come in and to look out in this audience and see so many smiling faces. Hint, hint, clue, clue. <laughs> Amen. But God is good, isn't he? God has blessed us once again to be here, knowing that our being here had nothing to do with your alarm clock. It wasn't... Because you are so healthy, because your very health is a gift from God. And so today I want to move rapidly into our message for this morning as we complete uh, this month's theme entitled, Show Me the Way to Glorify God. And before we do that, I just want to uh, recognize a card that we received today from the Johnson family. Uh, as you know, they have been stricken with grief and bereavement in the loss of Cherry's sister. And I want to commend this church for the support that you have, how you allow God to use you as an instrument of support uh, to this family in their moment of bereavement. And to express their appreciation, they sent a card just... Uh, stating how much they appreciate that. Uh, it, it goes on to talk about uh, thanksgiving and prayer uh, to all of you who God dispatched as an angel of mercy. God dispatched you as an angel of grace and comfort. And so when people are comforted by God's people presence, we ought to recognize that. So I just want to say uh, to the Johnson family, uh, we're still praying for you. There are others in this audience, uh, even as I speak, who are dealing with uh, bereavement, who are dealing with adversities and all kinds of circumstances. Don't for one moment think that God has not noticed you. Amen. And we, the Lion Street family, we understand not only is our obligation, but it's our privilege uh, to pray for you. And we will continue to do that. And so to the Johnson family, but not only that family, but all the families who are experiencing a great need for prayer and supplication in their behalf, we are here uh, to continue uh, to lift you up. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the passage that was read in your hearing, the Acts of the Apostles. And I always say that human authors have coined this book, the Acts of the Apostles. But I think a better rendering of this title would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit that imbibed them and allowed them and empowered them to do and to say all the things that they communicated to us in Scripture. So as we turn to that passage, and again, as I stated earlier, we're talking about show me the way to glorify God. And if you want to glorify God, there are, you know, we can't just do God's will our way, and expect it to be God's will. <laughs> Sometimes we get so caught up in ourselves and we want to do our thing. Come on, Come on. And then, by, by the way, God, All right, yeah. in Jesus' name, amen. Right. Well, when we talk about show me the way to glorify God, we understand that we need help from God. Yeah. If we're going to go his way, it must be according to his will. And therefore, in accordance to his word. So therefore, we looked at, uh, show me the way to become a Christian, number one. What does that mean to enter into this covenant relationship because of our position in Christ Jesus? And then we say that if you really want to glorify God, it's all about having an attitude and a disposition that, that humbles itself before God and says, uh, speak, Lord, and your servant heareth. Come in, and I will obey. That's a mindset. That's an attitude and a disposition that we must have that allows us to go into the presence of God humbly, meekly, with courage, however, saying, yes, I will go wherever you lead me, wherever you send me. Yes, I will speak the words that you give me to say. Do you possess that attitude? Do you possess that attitude that says, here am I, send me? If we want to glorify God. 
We must not only say, at thy will, and at thy word, we will. But also, in order to glorify God, we need to understand the meaning and the importance of obedient faith. You see, faith that is not obedient faith is not faith. For James helps us to understand that even, even the devils believe to the point of shuddering before the presence of God. But that belief, uh, that awareness of God did not translate into obedience to God. So faith is more than a mental assent to God. For the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please him. Not only must we be, be aware of his existence, but also understanding that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Amen. And so today, I want to use this morning to talk about the relations, the relations of baptism. Now, in your program, it's going to say the relationships between baptism and salvation. While we will deal with that, more specifically, however, I want to deal with the relations of baptism. Well, Brother Mary, what do you mean by that? You see, when we talk about doing the will of God, it ought to be very simple to comply to the will and the word of God. But you see, this world in which we live is filled with controversy. Controversy over the interpretation and application of the word of God. Why? Why is there so much controversy? I maintain that most of the controversy is man-made controversy. Man-made controversy. You see, sometimes we don't want to get with God's program. And we, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, go about to establish our own righteousness. And so, when we talk about obeying the will of God, I hope that in today's message, we're able to gain a firm footing on the relationship of baptism, um, not only to salvation, but as we contemplate the significance of baptism. Notice, whenever, whenever you want to determine the importance of a thing, it will behoove us to measure that thing in relationship to other things around it. In other words, the Bible says in Mark 16, Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, go ye into all, uh, uh, no, what is it, preach the word of God. Turn with me to Mark chapter <laughs> 16. And verse number 15, preach the gospel to every creature, okay? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Notice the word baptized is preceded by he that does what? Believeth. And it is followed by what? Shall be saved. If you want to understand the significance of baptism, look at baptism in relations to what's around it. Does that make sense? So when he says, uh, he that believeth, we understand the importance of faith. For last week we said, without it, it's impossible to please God in the first place. So therefore, if we understand the importance of faith, uh, he says, he that believeth, and, coordinating conjunction, by the way, that links those two together, and is baptized, shall future tense. In other words, if you do this, you'll get that. Right? We understand how important salvation is, don't we? Linking salvation and belief is held together by the act of compliance with that belief, producing salvation, that is, being baptized. Then why the controversy? Then why the controversy? The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 and 26 and 27, it says, For you are all sons or children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For many who have been baptized into Christ, 
has done what? Put on Christ. Notice, baptized into Christ is preceded by what? Being a son of God. If you want to be a child of God, what is the, re- the, the, the requisite? The prerequisite is faith. But the requisite is what? You have to be baptized. Whenever you want to understand the importance of a thing, look at that thing in relationship to the things around it. Notice, my objective is simply that we effectively communicate uh, this very important act of submission. See, baptism is not a work as some would tout it to be. Some people deny and reject baptism because they say it's a work. It's an act of submission. The Bible says we ought to submit uh, to baptism. Even in the text that was read in your hearing, when they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, repent and be, and be baptized. You don't even baptize yourself. You submit to baptism. Repent is important. We know, we know we must return from our evil and sinful ways and thoughts, right? He said, repent and do what? Be baptized. Now, what follows that? You shall receive, no, excuse me, for the remission of your sins. So if you want the remission of your sins, you ought to be baptized. But not only do we see the remission of sins, we also see you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, before I get too ahead of myself, let me say that uh, we ought to effectively communicate this very important act of submission and obedience to God. Not only is it to God, but it's to his conditions for pardon. In other words, if you want to receive pardon, because we're all guilty, right? And we need to be pardoned. If you want to receive pardon today, that means you ought to be in compliance to the will and will of God, resulting in entrance into the very body of Christ. Now, let us consider this text. There are four things I want to share with you in in English language or in any language. It's important to understand the power of prepositions. Prepositions are those small little bitty words that give direction to our speech. And I want to introduce to you and examine four prepositions we're teaching today. Four prepositions. And we're going to evaluate how those prepositions relate to baptism. First of all, I want us to consider the element and the authority for baptism. The element and the authority for baptism. Now, before we do that, what is baptism? Now, what we're not going to do today, we're not going to talk about, you know, methods or modes of baptism. (laughs) Reason why we're not going to discuss whether or not baptism is sprinkling or, or pouring, we're not even going to do that. The reason why we're not going to do that is the word baptism itself comes from the word baptizo. That simply means to immerse. It means to dip, to plunge, or to, to immerse, to dunk. <laughs> so you can't talk about, do, we, do you dunk or do you immerse by sprinkling? That doesn't make any sense. So we won't even go there. Do we, you baptize or do you immerse? Do you bury in, by, by pouring? You look at me and say, are you some kind of idiot? The word itself, by definition, means to immerse. So we're not going to get into all that because we understand the word baptism means to immerse. John, in the King James, it says John the Baptist, right? But if you look at it, it's John the Immerser because he came immersing people in water. So we're not going to get into that. But what we do want to get into is these four prepositions today. The first preposition we're going to entertain uh, that relates to baptism is the preposition in. In. Which points to the element in which we are baptized. Baptism is performed in an element. We understand that the element is water. 
Notice, the element has to first be defined. The element is water. How do we know that? Well, the Bible makes it clear that when John the Immerser, or John the Baptizer, he was in the River Jordan, uh, baptizing in the River Jordan. Jesus came to John to be baptized. And the Bible says they went into the water. And he baptized him. And notice, it, the Bible says, and they came out straightway out of the water. Helping us to understand that it wasn't a glass of water. They went into the water. And he baptized him. And then they straightway came out of the water. Not only that, but we understand that when Philip encountered the Ethiopian, the Bible says as they were riding along, he was teaching them the word of God. He looked out and he said, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? They said, stop the chariot. And they got out of the chariot and they went down into the water. And he baptized him. And then they came out of the water. And then he went on his way rejoicing. The household of Cornelius. The household of Cornelius. We find that uh, 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 at about midnight they were doing what's called the jailhouse rock. And the, the jailhouse started to rock. And we know the story how the prison bars were, were open and all the fetters fell off their hands, but they did not try to escape. And then the jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says that uh, they were baptized uh, that, e that very night. Notice the household uh, of Cornelius, there was a question that came and said, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized? The Bible used the word baptism metaphorically. When it talks about the church, it's cleansed by the washing of water by the word. The Bible goes on to say that our bodies have been washed with pure water, Hebrews 10, 22. So we understand that all of these, all of these, Instances point to uh, baptism as immersion, and the element was water. So why then, Brother Mary, whether is it necessary for you to go through this long litany of passages about baptism into water? Well, I think it's necessary for us to do that because not only we have, do we have the element identified, we have to have the element clarified because in the New Testament... Several baptisms are mentioned. So we need to clarify why we have identified the baptism that is to be performed today as water. Someone might say, well, the Bible says uh, I, we can be baptized in the, the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit baptism. We have to talk about that today. And I'll be very, very candid about that. Because I think we need to clear up some things as it relates to the Holy Spirit baptism. But then someone else may say, well, I want to be baptized in fire. Get me the fire. You don't want the fire. We're going to talk about that. Notice the element clarified. Yes, the New Testament speaks of other baptisms. Let's talk about Holy Spirit baptism a little bit for just a moment. Notice, if you will, in Acts, in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 1, uh, while Jesus was here on earth after his resurrection, but had not ascended yet back to the Father, he spent some 49 days uh, with his disciples. And one came to him saying, um, tell us. You know, when all these great things about your kingdom will come about. Notice what he says uh, in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. It says, when they therefore will come together, they ask him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the time or the seed in which the Father hath put into his own hand, into his own power. But ye, watch this now, don't miss this. But ye shall receive, receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In other words, 
the receiving of the Holy Ghost is identified by the receiving of this power that's going to come upon them. Notice, underline this in your mind, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, baptism was a promise that they resonate. Jesus promised those disciples uh, not to leave. First of all, don't leave Jerusalem. Tarry in Jerusalem, and you are going to receive power from on high when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Acts chapter 2, what do we see? In Acts chapter 2, we see them waiting, patiently waiting. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost, uh, when it had fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place, waiting, waiting for the promise. And then the Bible goes on to say, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And uh, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it settled to them. And they were filled with what? With the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak another tongue as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the point I want to make is, Jesus said, you're going to receive the fulfillment of this promise with power. And the Bible says when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they received what? Power. And they began to identify and, and demonstrate that power, being able to speak in languages that they never learned before. Why we know the Bible says that all these different people from all different regions, uh, all these different tongues or languages heard them speaking in a language that they could understand. And then they said, what mean is this? Are these guys drunk? Because, you know, they, they must be of some new wine. And then Peter, standing up with the eleven, he says, uh, we are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the, the, the ninth hour, third hour of the day. He says, but this is that. That's it right there. He said, this is that. Well, what is this that we have to refer to as that? He begins to go back and quote scripture. He said, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. When he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Amen. You see, he, he made, it's a promise of God repeated and accentuated by Jesus in Acts chapter 1. This is that which is spoken by the prophet uh, Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Amen. Fulfillment of a promise. Fulfillment of a promise. The Holy Spirit was given on that day with only, only Jews. It was only Jews who had received, but he said, on all flesh. Well, wait a minute. If it's on all flesh, why did the Holy Spirit only fall on the Jews? Well, glad you asked me that. In Acts chapter 10, uh, the household of Cornelius, the Bible says those were Gentiles. And you know that, uh, first of all, let me just say this. Peter, he had some bigotry. Peter had some racial, uh, some racism uh, running through his veins. How do we know that? Well, when he received a, a message from God in a vision, when he be God began to, to spread out this large sheet with all these different uh, animals on this uh, sheet that were unclean for the Jew, he said, rise, Peter, slay and eat. He said, oh, no, Lord, I can't deal with anything unclean. And then God said, what I made, how are you going to call it unclean? What are you trying to say to me? <laughs> what he was trying to help Peter understand was that whole bigotry stuff, that whole I'm better than you because I'm who I am and you who you are, all that racism stuff, you got to squash that. Please. Please. He, was, he was telling him, you need to go and now speak to those individuals who you swore you would never speak to. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Amen. And as soon as he got the vision, guess what? Somebody knocking on the door. <laughs> Come from, come from the household of Cornelius. All right. And then he went to the household of Cornelius and preached the gospel. And then the Gentiles also received the Holy Ghost to help us to understand that it's for all men. This is a fulfillment of what uh, Joel said. This is that. I'm pouring out my spirit on all flesh. I want to talk about Holy Ghost baptism. If you're waiting on it, you missed it. That was the power 
that enabled those apostles to preach the word, resulting in your opportunity to obey the will and word of God. Notice, notice this. The Bible helps us to understand that this baptism, um, not only was it identified, but it was clarified. We're not talking about Holy Spirit baptism because you cannot obey a promise. You can receive a promise, but you can't obey a promise. Notice further, some boys say, well, I'm waiting on the fire baptism. Remember over there in the, in, in the book of Matthew, about the fourth chapter, when, 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 when John the Baptist is going and preaching and, and men came to him uh, being dispatched by those scribes and Pharisees asking, are you the Christ? And he began saying, well, I, I'm, I'm a myth and I'm going to tell the truth. No, I'm not. He began to say, there's one who comes who is mightier than I. I'm not worthy to one latch his sandals. Right? He also said, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Right. Then he began to say, the axe is laid at the tree. See, God is going to sin his judgment. You see, I'm baptizing in the water right now, but Jesus is going to come and baptize with fire, uh, excuse me, and the Holy Ghost. Right. And then he said, the winnowing fork is already out there. Gathering up and uh, separating the wheat from the chaff. If you are on the wrong side of this, uh, of this thing, you're going to find yourself cast into the fire. So folks talking about fire baptism, John is talking about judgment. Judgment that, that, that God is going to take on those who do not know him and do not obey the gospel of Christ. Do you really want that? If you're looking for the fire baptism, keep on living the way you're living because there's sure enough coming. So again, one with a promise and one with a warning. But let me just say this. If we see these multiple baptisms alluded to in New Testament Scripture, why then would the Apostle Paul say it in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, in verse number five? He said there is what? One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Understand that the book of Ephesians was written somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 62 or 63 A.D., some 30 some odd years after the creation of the church in Acts chapter 2. So therefore, in the time of the Apostle Paul, he said, there's one baptism. There's one baptism. How do we differentiate and determine what he's talking about? Well, one baptism that was alluded to in the New Testament Scripture was a baptism that was a promise. The Holy Spirit baptism. There was another baptism he alluded to was one of judgment, which was fire. There was a warning. The baptism that the Apostle Paul is referencing is a baptism uh, that was commanded. It was a baptism that had to be administered by man. To man. You can't command someone to be baptized in fire. You cannot command someone to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can promise that it's coming. You can warn them against it. But if there's a command that we must hear and respond to, there's only one element, and that's being baptized in water. Notice, notice this. The command, repent and be baptized in order that in order that you might receive something. Understand further, this baptism that we are to adhere to today is one that has to be administered by men. How do we know that? In Matthew chapter 28, 19 through 20, or 18 through 20, Jesus, the triumphant, resurrected Savior, said, All authority in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. He gave them marching orders. It's something when they, when they preach the word. See, see, part and partial of making a disciple, it includes baptizing them. So therefore, if I say to Brother Gallette, uh, you need to be baptized, that's something that can be 
obeyed. That's something that can be administered by man to man. It also says, and when you do this, he said, make disciples of all nations. It's something that is worldwide in scope. It's age lasting. <laughs> so when we talk about baptizing, it's something that we must be able to perform on somebody else. All over the world. Everyone who hears the message ought to be able to respond to it. When you hear the gospel that about Jesus Christ being the Son of God and the sacrificial or vicarious sacrifice, in other words, the substitutionary death, he's your substitute. He died for you instead of you. And as you begin to understand that and you want to obey the gospel, you must obey the command. <laughs> it must be something that is administered by man. Worldwide and age-lasting. The only baptism that we can respond to, the only baptism that can be administered by man is not Holy Ghost baptism where folk be saying that stuff. It's not fire baptism. Folk get off on that trip with that. It's being baptized in the very element that God has made available to everyone on this planet. To be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sin. We're going to get into the power of baptism now. I don't see nothing in that water. Who was that guy who had to go get baptized in the Jordan seven times? I don't, I don't know water. Why do people have a, a, a problem with that? I don't know. I think they have a problem with it because of the man-made controversies. The man-made controversies. The power of baptism. Notice the preposition once again. In. It's not also in an element, which is water. But also the Bible says we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, when one is baptized into the name of Jesus, really what they're saying is he's been baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ. We are recognizing uh, the glory of God. We're recognizing Jesus as having all authority. We are responding in view of his glory. In other words, we are submitting to the lordship of Christ. He is Lord. The Bible says he was determined to be, approved or demonstrated to be, the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. He says, all authority has been given unto me. And if you understand that Jesus has all authority, then you won't have a problem submitting to his command. It's an issue about your will versus his will. See, sometimes man has his own will and his own agenda. We want to have righteousness our way and never submitting to the will and the authority or the lordship of Christ. When I baptize in the name of Jesus or by the authority of Jesus, in other words, I'm trusting in his merit, in his righteousness, not my own. When I'm baptized in the name of Jesus, in other words, I'm, I'm appealing to him to wash away my sins. You see, obedience to the lordship of Christ uh, ought to be a given. And when we are baptized in the name of Jesus, we are cognizant of the authority of Christ. We understand the merit of his vicarious sacrifice. Knowing that we could not offer a sacrifice that was worthy to merit an audience with God. So Jesus steps in and he died for us. For God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of God. When we obey his will. Notice, I spend too much time talking about the element and the authority of baptism. I want to switch and begin to talk about not the element, but the elevation. The elevation of baptism. Meet me in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. It says, For by, for by the second preposition that relates to baptism is the preposition by. In other words, it signifies the means. He says, by 
one spirit? Are we all baptized into one body? Well, wait a minute. I thought you'd already nullified this whole thing about Holy Spirit baptism. Notice this doesn't say you've been baptized in or with the Holy Spirit. It says baptized, notice the preposition, by the one spirit into one body. I say we need to look at that as we look at the second preposition. What does it mean to be baptized by the spirit? What does that mean? How do you articulate to someone just what that means? Well, by the one spirit, we are baptized into one body. That comes after hearing the gospel, right? As you hear the gospel, then we respond by being baptized. But then this text says it's by the one spirit that we're baptized in the one body. Well, let me offer this to you. To be baptized by the one spirit simply means you're being baptized in accordance with the Spirit's instruction. Amen. Being baptized in accordance with the Spirit's teaching. Okay. Get for me Second Peter. Second Peter, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 20. Second Peter, chapter 1 and verse number 20. When the Bible says, knowing this, that no prophecy is of any private interpretation. For men, they were not concocting what to say when they were speaking or prophesying the word of God. It's that men were speaking the word as they were being moved by the Spirit of God. In other words, the Spirit of God directed and gave unction and gave fluidity to their speech. And they began to speak. That's why the Bible says uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1 that uh, the angels in heaven desire to look on the things that we are getting freely. He says, even the prophets who spoke about those things that the Spirit of Christ that was in them had them prophesied. They were searching the Scriptures diligently to see uh, what season these things were coming about. The very thing that they were prophesying, they didn't understand all of it. However, the, 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 the Spirit superintended. The Spirit uh, gave them the words to say. The Spirit was moving them. To give instruction. And when we obey the instruction, resulting in our being baptized, is the result of the Holy Spirit's guidance. So when it says you have been uh, by one spirit, you're baptized into one body, it simply means you have now heard and obeyed the Holy Spirit's instruction. And now you are simply obeying. Notice this. Some of you guys are just looking at me. Notice what the Bible, yeah, let me, let, me, let, me, let me screw that in a tighter than this. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, what does it say? It says, it talks about, you know, putting on the whole armor of God, right? The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. And it says, and in your hand, what? The sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Stay with me now. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So the Word of God is, see, the Spirit is the author of the Word of God. That's why Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses when you receive power. You'll receive power when you receive the Spirit. And when you receive the Spirit and you got this power, you're now going to begin to speak and preach the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, producing faith in the hearts of the hearer. And then that penitent believer now will say, what must I do? The word of God is going to help you to say, you need to repent and be baptized. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the architect and the author of the word of God. And so therefore, when you are being baptized by the Spirit, you're being baptized in accordance with the teaching and the instruction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Say amen when you can. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, some three times, it says, hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear, <laughs> hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. How were they to hear what the Spirit was saying to the churches? By reading the writings of John the Revelator. As John was on the Isle of Patmos, and he received the revelation 
of Jesus Christ. As he began to read, to, to pen, and to write what he had received, we are to now read his writings to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying. And you make a decision as to whether or not you want to comply to it. But when you do comply and you are baptized into Christ, you are doing what? Being baptized by the one spirit into the one body. See, the word is a product of the spirit. Understand that. So baptism is a direct command of God. When man come, And I wonder why this is such a head trip about baptism if it is a command of God. Maybe that's a man-made controversy. Maybe it's a man-made controversy. For when a man complies with the Spirit's instruction, God promises to save him, which presupposes that no one can follow in the steps of Jesus who refuses to obey the will of God. I got a few more minutes. Let me, let me offer. Let me offer. Thank you. Let me offer what I call the essentiality. The essentiality of baptism. And in, in order for us to understand, we want to understand the purpose of baptism. That brings us to the third preposition that relates to baptism is the word for. For. After hearing the message by the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, he was in the middle of his sermon, and they interrupted him by asking, what shall we do? Which brings us back. It brings us back to our original text. The Bible says, Jesus began this sermon. Now he, 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 he's... Finishing up this sermon, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made uh, that same Jesus, whom, by the way, you crucified. Don't forget that. By the way, you crucified both Lord and Christ, the long-awaited Messiah that you've been praying for and been tarrying for. He came and you killed him. Can you imagine the head trip? Can you imagine the guilt trip? The guilt complex that they had. They asked the question, what shall we do? And he said, repent. He says, repent. Every one of you. Ah, let me just read that. Now when they heard this, they were pricked. And that word pricked helps me understand that they believe what they heard. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And not only will you receive remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, Their awareness of their need prompted this question. When they came to grips with the fact that they had crucified the Christ, when they came to grips with the fact that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, and they began to say, oh, I can't stand it anymore. I can't. Have you ever been in a situation where Something happened, some news or a realization of your own sinfulness and you, you felt so bad about it, gave you a headache, got that wrenching gut feeling. They, were, they had that kind of wrenching gut feeling and they said, what shall we do? How do we come from under this weight of guilt Amen. associated with our sinful deeds? See, that's what sin will do. It'll make you guilty. It'll make you feel depressed uh, and oppressed. And they said, what shall we do? How do we come out from under this burden that's on us? So therefore, they had an awareness of their need. And that awareness prompted the question, what can we do to alleviate the guilt associated with our sin? You see, the purpose 
of the act is wrapped up in this word for. Now, the Greek word for for is the word ace. And let me just say, the word for is really pointing them to a future event. If you want to receive forgiveness of sin, then you ought to repent and be baptized. Because when you repent and be baptized, you're really doing that looking forward to receiving something. Remission of sin. Now, some would say, some would say that the word for means because of or on account of. If that is the case, they're saying that one can be saved before baptism. So I'm being baptized because I've already received remission of sins, which presupposes that I've already received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So therefore, man's concoction would say that baptism is simply uh, something that you do because you are already saved. Have you ever heard that before? You believe that? Some may. But I want us to look closer. Some would suggest that it means because you're already saved. But now when I look at Acts 22 and 16, where Saul of Tarsus, who was later be called, to be called the Apostle Paul, encountered one named Ananias, and he says, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sin, calling on the name of the Lord. So therefore, if baptism, I mean, if salvation is before, if salvation is before baptism, that means your sins are forgiven before or prior to right. baptism, then why would Ananias say to Paul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins if your sins are already forgiven before baptism? See, let me just offer this to you, for you scholars out there, for you grammarians out there. The word ace May, I mean, the word for in English may sometimes, on occasion, be used, can be used as because. But in the Greek, the word ace is never, never. used to say because of. Right. It's always in view, in view of, in order that one may obtain. Right. That's why he says, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for, in view of, or in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. <sighs> See, to say that one is saved prior to baptism is to suggest that a person can be saved outside of the body of Christ. You don't have to be a Christian to be saved. If you say that baptism... It's not essential to salvation. The one is saved before they're baptized. Notice what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3. He says, for you are all children of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. Well, then, if we're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, how do we become children of God? Well, for many of you who have done what? Being baptized into Christ. Have now clothed yourself or been enveloped by the righteousness of Christ. If you want to be a child of God, you've got to be where Jesus is. The Bible says, for many of you who have been baptized into Christ, that's how you become a child of God. Right. This is not rocket science. See, let's do a, 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 a textual comparison here. Because many still are saying that 
for the remission of sin means because of the remission of sin, right? That's what people say. We've already demonstrated that's not what the Bible says. But sometimes we need a little more evidence, a little more proof. Turn with me quickly to Matthew, Matthew, the 26th chapter. See, we, we, we use this in, in when we do our communion, right? Let's, let's look at this text quickly. Matthew, the, 20, the 26th chapter and the 28th verse. And I want you to just listen with me as I read. Notice what happened in verse number 28. This is the communion setting, right? This is the communion setting, the, 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 the last supper. And in 28, he says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. He said his blood has been shed for many. For what purpose? Because your sins are already forgiven. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If we interpret Acts 2 and 38, the same construction of the sentence, if we're saying that uh, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, if for the remission of sins mean because you already have your sins forgiven, well, then when we go back and use the same analogy in Matthew chapter 26 and 28, when Jesus says, my blood has been shed for the remission of sins, if we were to use that same analogy, we would say that his blood was shed because your sins are already forgiven. If your sins are already forgiven, there's no need for him to shed his blood. We understand it from that text, but then we, get, we just go lunatic in the other text. I wonder why. Maybe it's because it is a man-made controversy. So therefore... If he shed his blood, uh, not because our sins were forgiven, but because we needed to have our sins forgiven, well, then our being baptized is for the remission of sin as well. We're baptized in order that our sins may be remitted. I don't think that's a big controversy myself. It seems, however, that it's clear command. Uh, this clear command should never be misinterpreted or misunderstood. And we see a group in Acts 2.38, watch this, a group, a group convicted of sin, a group convinced of the deity of Jesus, receiving a simple answer to a simple question, what shall we do? It was a simple question, and he gave a simple answer, well, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And when you do that, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, that brings me to my final, well, I got to hurry up, my final preposition. And this one helps us to understand not only the, the element or the elevation or even the essentiality, but this one helps us to see the entrance into the church, the relationship with the entrance in the church and baptism. And I want to offer the preposition into. Into. In other words, we've looked at in water and in the name of Jesus. We've looked at uh, by, okay, which helps us understand the means by which is by the Holy Spirit. And then we've looked at uh, for our purpose, and now we want to look at entrance. What helps us to gain a position in Christ? Well, I venture to say that this text uh, gives us insight into that. The Bible says, or the Bible uses uh, this fourth preposition that relates to baptism into from a spiritual perspective and also a physical perspective. From a spiritual perspective, 
It means uh, to be in, baptized into Christ means to uh, be in the truth or the teachings of Christ. But from a physical perspective, it means to be in the body of Christ. How does one get into the teachings of Christ? From a spiritual perspective. And then how does one get into the body of Christ? From a spiritual perspective. Notice the Bible says, uh, even in this text that we've looked at in 1 Corinthians, that we're baptized into the body of Christ. We understand from Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23, that the body is the church. Stay with me on this. If you're baptized into the body of Christ, you're baptized into the church of Christ. Amen. Notice, the Bible says that the Lord adds to the church those who are being saved. If you want to be saved, you ought to be where the saved are. You ought to be, or you better be, in the church. I want to just say this. Not only does it mean being coming into the body of Christ, it means being baptized into the name of Christ. We already talked about the authority of Christ, right? So therefore, if Jesus has all authority, and we want to be in Christ, and he says be baptized, we ought to be baptized the way he says we ought to be baptized, right? right. Notice what he says when he says all authority is, in, is given to me. He says, baptizing them into, into the name of the Father, into the name of the Son, and into the name of the Holy Ghost. And when you do that, simply put, it combines the authority of the Godhead. It brings me into complete covenant relationship. Complete covenant relationship. When you are in, when you're baptized into the name or into the possession of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it means you now have a complete covenant relationship. Complete covenant blessings also are afforded to you. For all spiritual blessings are found where? In Christ. If you want forgiveness of sin, you must be where? In Christ. If you want uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, you ought to be where? In Christ. If you want to be in a position of no condemnation, you ought to be where? In Christ. If you want to be a new creation, you ought to be where? In Christ. If you want to have uh, uh, eternal life, eternal life is in Christ Jesus. So in other words, if you want it, you got to get where it is. It's in Christ Jesus. When you are baptized into Christ, do you not know that you are baptized into his death? Into his death. That's what Romans 6 and 3 says. Uh, when we're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his death. In other words, when you're baptized into his death, you are baptized into the benefits of his death. He died, so you don't have to die. He died that you might live. He died that you, uh, to satisfy the righteous requirement of God that you could not satisfy. You could not keep it. Jesus said, I keep it for you. So not only if you're in Christ, you become a covenant partner, not because of you, but because of Jesus. Please. You're baptized into his death, and therefore you are baptized into the benefits of his death. I wish I had time to deal with Romans chapter 6 and verse number 3 as it corresponds with Romans chapter 6 and verse number 17, where it says, God be thanked that, uh, that you were, you were in bondage to sin. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. And now you've been made free from sin when you obey from the heart Amen. that form of teaching. Amen. Finally, uh, how does one get into Christ? The Bible says, uh, we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ. If you want to be in Christ, you got to be baptized into Christ. Amen. You can run around tearing, tearing for the Holy Ghost all you want to. You'll be on the outside looking in. You got to be baptized into Christ. It's a simple question. One of utmost importance, however, have you been baptized in water in the name of Jesus by the one Spirit? for or in view of the remission of your sins. If you've done that, you ought to be telling somebody else. If you have not done that, let me just borrow the words of Ananias. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 
because washing away your sins through baptism is synonymous and tantamount with calling on the name of the Lord. Ain't nobody just saying, Jesus, 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 I'm a sinner coming to my life, all that kind of, those nursery rhymes and all that kind of, ain't nothing about that. It's, all, it's about compliance and obedience to the will of God. If you're here today and you have not, and you know who you are, you know whether or not you responded uh, to the gospel message, you have an opportunity to do so today by understanding, yes, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Just like those guys on the day of Pentecost when they realized that he was indeed the Messiah, they said, what must we do? And he said, now that you believe, you need to now repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the washing away of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost.